Good afternoon, everyone joining us here online for our webinar uh, focusing on identifying pathways to smoking cessation. My name is Jeff Smith, and I'm a senior fellow in the Integrated Harm Reduction Program at, our, at the R Street Institute. R Street is a nonprofit, nonpartisan policy organization focused on advancing limited, effective government in a wide variety of areas, including harm reduction, tobacco harm reduction. A foundational component of our work is a belief that health policy grounded in harm reduction has the potential to, distract, to drastically reduce the negative consequences associated with various harmful behaviors while significantly relieving the burden of cost to the healthcare system. Today, our focus is going to be on uh, better understanding the drivers of human behavior, specifically as they relate to behavioral change and smoking. We know that many adult smokers want to quit smoking, yet it's a very difficult thing for them to do. Uh, this idea is a very challenging construct, especially for those who do not smoke, to understand. It is clear that the long-term use of combustible cigarettes greatly increase the likelihood of smoking-related death and disease. And knowing that there's such high risk of, of, of negative health, health outcomes, shouldn't it be easy enough to encourage, shouldn't that be enough? Uh, to encourage those who smoke to quit. Well, the reality of it is that human behavior is never cut and dry. Back in 1905, now again, my history is a, as a college professor, so if I don't reflect on things from a historical perspective, I, I can't sleep at night. So we'll, we'll start with uh, a, a scientist by the name of Edward Thorndike, who was able to sum up the complexities of human behavior with a simple yet elegant behavioral law. It's known as the law of effect. This law simply states that any behavior we produce will either have a positive consequence or a negative one. If the behavior that you're, that you're engaging in repeatedly leads to an outcome that's positive, then it's more likely that behavior will continue. If a behavior that you engage in yields an outcome that's not positive, a negative one, then it's less likely that behavior will include, uh, will continue. Um, so what's really elegant about this, this, this concept is that Thorndike never defined what were positive and what were negative outcomes. That was up to the individual to decide based on their learned experience. So even if something might seem to be negative to one person, it may be positive to another. And understanding this kind of helps begin to shed some light on complexities in terms of changing and, and moving people away from uh, risky behaviors to uh, less harmful ones that can uh, greatly improve the quality of their lives. So today we're gonna to talk more uh, about some of the key drivers associated with smoking behavior and how we might be able to leverage those characteristics to help individuals who smoke to find a pathway away from smoking toward engaging with other products that carry less risk and less potential harm. Um, I've, I'm really excited with the, the group that we've put together to, 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 uh, to uh, speak with today. Uh, we have three amazing uh, scholars joining us. I'm going to briefly introduce them each and then give each one of them about 10 minutes to talk about the areas that they're most intrigued by. Um, following uh, that conversation, we'll come back together and uh, talk amongst ourselves as well as answer any questions that uh, the audience members may have for us to share. Um, if you do have a question, all you have to do is at the bottom of the Zoom window, you should see an option for Q&A. Um, type in your question and your affiliation, and our moderators will pass those questions on to us. And given the amount of time that we have, we'll try to, to uh, address as many of those as possible. So our first speaker tonight, uh, this afternoon, is Dr. Donald Kinkle. He is the Andrew Dixon White Professor in the Department of Economics at the Je uh, Jeb E. Brooks School of Public Pro Policy at Cornell University. His research in empirical health economics focuses on consumer health behaviors, which include both uh, areas of, of drinking alcohol as well as smoking behavior. Our second speaker will be Dr. Christopher Russell. Uh, Dr. Russell is a behavioral scientist, and he directs the Russell Burnett Research and Consultancy Group out of Glasgow, UK. In this role, Dr. R uh, Russell leads the design, conduct, and reporting of uh, research studies associated with pre-market and post-market uh, perception and behavioral research uh, in the tobacco uh, harm uh, reduction space, um, which includes obviously electronic nicotine delivery systems, heated tobacco products, as well as modern oral tobacco products. And our final uh, panelist is Dr. Neil Sherwood. 
Um, and he is a, a psychopharmacologist by training, has more than 30 years of experience in drug, tobacco, and regulatory science, covering aspects of, of, of research methodologies within the tobacco regulatory uh, science uh, for both conventional as well as uh, the novel reduced risk products that have been in the marketplace over the last couple of decades. Um, his areas of expertise includes epidemiology, addiction behavior, smoking behavior, as well as uh, perception and intention studies. Um, so uh, Dr. Uh, Kinkle uh, is going to talk about the economics of tobacco harm reduction, and we'll go ahead and, and hand it off to him. All right. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. And let me, I'm going to be just trying to share my screen here. Okay. So uh, let me uh, try to move quickly here. First slide is... Um, self-explanatory. Uh, so um, I would probably have an interesting conversation with um, Dr. Smith about how to relate the economic approach to thinking about things like this to um, th the Thorndike um, law of effect. I think actually there'd be quite a lot of similarities. And what I really want to talk about today is just saying that you know, while there's a lot of discussion about applying economic models to addiction, there also has been a lot of research suggesting that a lot of the basic economic insights do apply to addictive behaviors, including especially smoking, or in particular for this talk, smoking. And I think especially perhaps the end of an addiction might sometimes be seeming more rational than the beginning of addiction, where it might be harder to understand why kids start to smoke in the beginning. But once somebody is smoking, uh, we understand that lots of them are trying to smoke, trying to quit every year. And as a matter of fact, you know, most smokers, um, of all people who have ever smoked in the U.S., most there are more not more former smokers than there are current smokers. So many smokers have managed to quit. And the economic insights here are that smokers' decisions to quit respond to the same incentives at work as other consumer markets. And we really think about risk perceptions as part of a cost. That if we think that this pro consuming this product is going to hurt me or kill me. Um, that's sort of a, we refer to that sometimes as the health price or part of the full price people pay for their consumption of this unrisk of this risky good. Um, of course, there's direct product taxes and prices that matter, and then finally there are more product features, nicotine delivery, flavors, etc. Uh, but those actually I'll mainly be deferring to my other the other speakers on this panel. I'll start then by emphasizing you know this important point that was made by Michael Russell a famous tobacco researcher back you know, decades ago in the British Medical Journal, that people smoke for the nicotine, but they die from the charm. So when we talk about people being addicted to smoking, they're addicted to the nicotine, but it's all the other stuff in the cigarette smoke that kills them. And so it's really the combustion of, to combustion of tobacco that leads to the tar that then creates, that's why cigarettes are such a risky um, product to consume. The converse of that, of course, is that non-combusted sources of tobacco offer this potential for tobacco harm reduction. So I thought I'd start off by um, the next slide here, just sort of say, again, of most smokers will have tried to, or a large fraction of smokers will have tried to quit smoking in the past year. And the most recent data that comes from the tobacco use supplement to the current population survey from 2022 gives a perspective of this, you know, a lot of surveys show something roughly like this, is that the most popular way that most smokers try to quit smoking is just to go cold turkey. They don't use any particular method. Um, but after that, almost as many are now using some kind of a nicotine product. Uh, these nicotine products contain either the nicotine replacement therapies, the pharmacological pharmaceutical products like nicotine patch, nicotine gum, um, but also e-cigarettes, which provide nicotine, but none of the combustion. Also nicotine pouches and also smokeless tobacco like snus again, which is found to provide nicotine without many of the harmful constituents of the combusted tobacco. Uh, there is one other type of smoking um, cessation method there, and those are the pharmaceutical pills um, that act differently. They're not nicotine replacement therapy, but they uh, change uh, uh, people's uh, cravings for nicotine in a, in a separate way. You can see they're relatively unpopular with less than 10% of quit attempts involving them and more than 40% of quit attempts involving some kind of nicotine, nicotine product. But looking overall, 
I would say, you know, the, the most important problem might be if you're thinking about smoking cessation is how to move people from that blue bar into one of the other bars, because those other bars are all more effective than shown in clinical trials to be more effective methods to um, quit smoking. In particular, e-cigarettes have been shown in clinical trials as being very effective to quit smoking. This is a slide from the Cochrane Review that did a systematic review of studies of nicotine, uh, of e-cigarettes and smoking cessation. It's actually a couple years old, but all the newer, as they keep on updating it, um, the evidence just gets stronger and stronger, including even the most recent survey, uh, Cochrane Review doesn't have the most recent data on this from a new paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, but it, as it comes out, you know, there's high certainty evidence that electronic cigarettes with nicotine are, but they, uh, they don't say this, but they're about twice as effective as nicotine replacement therapies. And nicotine replacement therapies, by the way, are about twice as effective as, uh, as cold turkey. So you can see that this really increases the probability of being able to quit. Um, and they don't detect any clear evidence yet of any e-cigarette harm, of any harms from e-cigarettes when used to quit smoking. So given that, you know, what are the sort of the barriers? I think one of the most important barriers to any kind of a nicotine product is the fact that almost half of U.S. smokers, and this is true in a lot of other countries, including the U.K., and where e-cigarettes are much more um, widespread, widely used and prescribed um, for smoking cessation, um, a large fraction of smokers believe that nicotine is a substance in cigarette smoke that causes most of the cancer. Now, this is simply not the case. It's not the nicotine, it's the tar. Um, as I think a tied result to that is that almost two thirds of people in the US incorrectly believe that e-cigarettes are as harmful or more harmful than cigarettes. There's a lot of discussion going on in this, you know, to tobacco researchers about exactly how less harmful e-cigarettes are. But there's no real serious debate that e-cigarettes are as harmful or more harmful. It's, it's a question of how much less harm, how much harm to reduction do we get from these cigarettes? Now, part of this, I think, and this is something we've studied at, at the Cornell team, is there was an outbreak of lung injuries in September, fall of 20, 2019, um, known as E-Valley, that the CDC eventually linked to the use of THC-based products and um, vitamin E acetate added to those products. And it, these were illegal products, but it was it increased the misperception, the misinformation shock that a lot of people thought it had to do with nicotine e-cigarettes. And that seemed to be further um, exacerbating uh, the, the misinformation people already had about e-cigarettes. As a final thing we'll, I'll point out, you know, the FDA currently mandates that all e-cigarettes sold in the US carry a warning label. This product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. Those two statements are perfectly true, perfectly accurate. It seems like useful information to provide consumers. However, when you link it to the fact that half of consumers think that nicotine is a substance that causes cancer, this is potentially a very scary message. I think unintended so. I think the FDA, um, you know, again, intended to give factual, correct information that would help people make decisions about e-cigarettes. In some research we have in progress, we find that this warning label tends to discourage smokers from switching to vaping, especially when or only when, only for those smokers who already incorrectly believe that nicotine cause, causes cancer. And so um, I'll kind of come back to that point, I guess, maybe at the, at the very last slide. Uh, the, in addition to information about the health price of smoking um, the, uh, and, and smoking cessation methods, you know, the traditional kind of main focus of economics is about the effects of prices. And there's a long standing body of research that finds that higher cigarette prices reduce smoking. Again, it might be a little bit surprising. I think it was 50 years ago when economists first started publishing these things. I've actually looked over all the old Surgeon General reports. And back in the 70s, they were really shocked. But by the 2000s, the Surgeon General reports and WHO reports and others are saying that Higher taxes to increase cigarette prices are one of the most effective ways we can have take to reduce smoking. There's a similar emerging line of research 
on e-cigarettes that are saying higher prices also reduce vaping. When you combine that with another additional research that says that economic that cigarettes and vapes are what economists call substitutes, it suggests that when we start taxing e-cigarettes, we're pushing people back to smoking. So this leads me to my final slide, almost semi penultimate slide, I guess, of evidence-based policies. I think most important is to inform consumers to correct misperceptions about nicotine and the riskiness of nicotine harm reduction products. Um, years ago, I had a chance to talk to Mitch Seller about this. Mitch Seller was the uh, director of the Center for Tobacco Products at FDA, and before that, had a lot of had uh, was involved in the pharmaceutical industry. And he was explaining that that was a huge part of the limitations that the NRT products, the nicotine caps, the nicotine gum, always faced. That they couldn't convince people that these were were healthy things. Uh, they'd say, "Well, why should I die from the nicotine in the patch? I'd rather die from the nicotine. I enjoy it the way I enjoy getting it smoking." That same kind of misperception, I think, is harm is cutting across the board of all the nicotine replacement products. Um, my second bullet point would be in terms of an evidence-based policy, we should be taxing cigarettes, but not vapes. In fact, I've always put, there's a lot of people that we talk about risk proportionate taxation. I tend to think that's not even necessarily enough. And I would point to state Medicaid programs that actually provide subsidies to nicotine replacement products and suggest maybe we should be thinking about the same for e-cigarettes. And again, the UK is doing something similar. Um, and finally, Leading up to the, the uh, next speakers, um, I'd say we should consider the impact of nicotine content and flavors on the adults smoking cessation. I give it my web page here, but basically Cornell Research and Tobacco Regulation, CRTR should get you there. And I did want to mention that, you know, all the, all these conclusions are my own, but I acknowledge past research support from the NIH and current research support um, from this uh, Foundation for a Smoke Free World. If you want to see those disclosures with more time to read them, Again, visit my website. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Don. Um, and we'll come back for questions. Uh, I have a couple uh, that we can talk about when we get back together at the end. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Dr. Russell, uh, and he will speak on how flavor influences behavior in the context of tobacco harm reduction. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Um, just checking that everyone can hear me and see my slides. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, uh, Don, for that. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining uh, this evening or this afternoon. Um, I'm going to be speaking, uh, giving a, a somewhat of a whistle stop tour of the brief history of evidence uh, around the role of ends flavors and smoking cessation. It's a very quick bio. Um, as Jeff mentioned earlier, director of RBRC, a company in the UK, we design, conduct and report perception and behavioural studies of the potential impact of new tobacco products on future tobacco use behaviour in the youth and adult populations. And we've received funding from ENS manufacturers to conduct such studies uh, for submission as part of PMTs. So the public health contribution that flavoured ends uh, can make uh, rests primarily on their effects on smoking cessation among adults who currently smoke and on tobacco use initiation among youth and young adults. And I'd like to start this presentation by summarising uh, my interpretation of how the FDA currently assesses and weighs the contributions of flavoured ends to adult cessation and youth initiation, specifically in the context of evaluating evidence submitted by end manufacturers as part of PMTAs. Since 2016, the FDA has repeatedly stated that maintaining adult smokers' access to ENDS cannot come at the expense of addicting a new generation of youth to nicotine. And so FDA's current position is that while the, the weight of current evidence suggests that ENDS do uh, have potential health benefits when used uh, entirely or substantially in place of combustible cigarettes, the evidence to FDA is clear that the appeal of flavours is a significant driver of ENDS use in initiation among adolescents and that flavours disproportionately appeal to youth compared to adults. Now, based on this evidence, in 2021, uh, the FDA formally stated, um, and you can, if you scan the QR code, it will take you to this, this document, 
formally stated that because tobacco flavor ends uh, may offer similar benefits to adult smokers as compared to flavored ends, while simultaneously not posing the same level of risk of youth initiation, it's important for FDA to review PMTAs for evidence of whether use of a flavored ends is likely to produce a switching or a cigarette reduction benefit to adult smokers that will be greater than the likely benefits associated with uh, using a tobacco flavored ends. So essentially they are tasking manufacturers to prove that uh, you, uh, predominant or regular use of a specific flavored end product um, is more likely to lead to uh, adult smokers completely switching or substantially reducing their cigarette consumption compared to adults who predominantly or regularly use tobacco flavored ends. And this sentiment echoes uh, what was a fairly prominent editorial published in the New England Journal of Medicine um, in uh, early 2019, where the authors um, essentially stated just that, that the public health problem that e-cigarettes were invented and innovated to solve, that is to help users of combustible cigarettes to stop smoking by switching to vaping, um, is adequately addressed by liquids that are not flavoured to taste like anything other than tobacco. Or, or said another way, tobacco flavoured liquids are sufficient to do the job uh, that adult smokers are, are seeking to achieve. And so this editorial therefore said that given that um, the, the presumption that flavoured products have no additional benefit but have a substantial additional risk, FDA should use their statutory power and remove those flavoured products from the market. So what then is the evidence that uh, flavoured ends products uh, compared to tobacco flavoured ends uh, increase adult smokers' likelihoods of three uh, three of the most important, important smoking cessation outcomes, intentions to quit smoking, attempts to quit smoking, and success in their attempt to quit smoking. So the best evidence of this uh, comes from a systematic review published in 2022 by Alex Lieber and colleagues. And in this systematic review, the authors uh, included 29 studies, uh, both cross-sectional and longitudinal in nature, that in some way assessed uh, differences in smoking cessation outcomes between groups of adult smokers who were predominant or regular or exclusive users of either non-tobacco, non-menthol flavored end products versus tobacco or menthol flavored products or versus tobacco only flavored products. Now what this um, review concluded uh, was that the evidence about the role of different flavored end use and smoking cessation outcomes is at present inconclusive. Now it's interesting to, or it's important to emphasize that the reason for this uh, inconclusive conclusion is not uh, due to uh, an absence of evidence of, of additional benefit associated with flavored end products, but rather this conclusion reflected highly heterogeneous study definitions, various methodological limitations, and essentially saying that the study, the 29 studies differed so dramatically uh, in their design and procedures and other features, which essentially made a, a, a clear assessment across the 29 studies virtually impossible. So it's important to, to, to take away that the authors are not saying that uh, that uh, flavoured products do not provide an additional benefit. They're saying that the studies that have been conducted to assess this question to date are so varied that it's difficult to get a, a clear sense of what the evidence is showing across all 29 studies. Now, these authors suggested that one method to address this uh, lack of convincing evidence would be uh, studies involving random assignment to, to use of end flavors. So basically saying more qu high quality evidence, ideally requir it required ideally from randomized controlled trials. And, and this uh, echoes um, what FDA has, has uh, since 2021 called for from manufacturers um, in the design and conduct of behavioral studies uh, to assess this question. So FDA now requires um, that studies conducted in support of PMTAs for flavored ends 
must compare switching and cigarette reduction effects of a specific ends, a specific flavored ends versus a specific tobacco flavored ends. Uh, they must provide evidence of product switching and cigarette reduction effects over time, i.e. longitudinally. And this evidence must be reliable and robust, ideally from an RCT or a longitudinal cohort study. Now, what's on screen um, represents uh, a typical RCT comparison of a, a non-tobacco versus tobacco flavored ends for producing outcomes such as complete switching or cigarette reduction. Now, an RCT of, of this kind is unarguably the strongest design for demonstrating the comparative efficacy of a flavored ends versus a tobacco flavored ends for producing smoking related health and behavioral outcomes. And this kind of study would involve recruiting um, a well-defined sample of adult smokers, random, randomizing them to, to one of the flavor groups, to use one of the flavors in, the, in, in each group, and, um, and instructing them on, on the use of the assigned product and, and on no use of other non-assigned products. The problem, as I see it, however, is an RCT like this is unlikely to create the conditions in which consumers in the real world try, use, and switch between products. For example, what we know about switchers, and we know a lot now, is that uh, e-cigarette users and end, end users are not a homogeneous group. They are different in their characteristics. Their reasons for using ends are varied. Um, the experiences that they're seeking from an ends are, are also varied. And most importantly, most end users don't use end products in the narrow, stable, uh, singular ways that are often required of participants in an RCT. Rather, access, what we do know is that access to a variety of products and the freedom to choose from among those products is important to switchers and their journey. And speaking of journey, we, we, we know how individuals' uh, initial preferences and actual use patterns change over time. So we know that all of that uh, fluidity and variability is important as part of the switching journey. RCTs by design, however, um, are unlikely to capture consumers' continuous journey of discovery and evolving preferences to, to find what, what satisfies them, what works for them in terms of different devices, flavors, nicotine strengths. And in fact, if designed well, um, then participants uh, initial and evolving preferences for the assigned and unassigned flavors would be deliberately eliminated from participants' behavior, suppressed out of the, the, the design. Um, and so this means that, for example, an RCT will, will not capture switching from, say, cigarettes to a tobacco flavor, but then later switching to a fruit flavor um, and, and possibly uh, exclusive using or, po or dual using or poly using different flavors, different nicotine strengths, different devices, even even different nicotine tobacco products. So just to summarize why um, I'm, I'm skeptical about the contribution that RCTs can make to our understanding of the role of ENDS flavors and smoking cessation is that to the extent that trial conditions uh, typically differ from real world market conditions, the participants in trials may be unlikely to resemble the population who would naturally try and use ends in the real world. The pat patterns of flavored ends use exhibited by trial participants may have limited generalizability for describing how real world users would actually use flavored ends in their everyday lives. And the effects of flavored ends on smoking behavior observed under trial conditions may have limited use for predicting smoking cessation outcomes in a real world post-market setting. In contrast to, <clears throat> sorry, in contrast to RCTs, however, uh, longitudinal cohort studies are a type of observational study design in which the investigators don't intervene to modify participants' uh, exposure to any factor or to any product, but rather they simply observe naturally occurring relationships between factors, products, and outcomes in a cohort of individuals over time. Now, importantly, in contrast to RCTs, participants in a cohort study are not given any guidance or any instruction as to what they should do, how they should behave, or how they should or should not use any products, uh, including uh, cigarettes or any, any end product or any other product. People are free to act as they wish. 
Longitudinal cohort studies such as the, the pop, uh, FDA's population assessment of tobacco and health study are ideal for collecting several types of real world information that are necessary for FDA to evaluate the, the public health impact of a flavored ends. Specifically, this type of study will tell you, can tell us, um, who in the population naturalistically tries and uses a flavored ends, how consumers actually use flavored ends in their everyday lives, and perhaps most importantly, what is the impact that naturalistic use of a flavored ends has on cigarette consumption over time? To what extent do, does the flavored ends product uh, replace or, or substitute for combustible cigarettes? And so when we look at evidence obtained from high quality prospective cohort studies, longitudinal cohort studies, we do in fact tend to, to find that smoking cessation rates are higher uh, among users of flavored ends than among users of tobacco flavored ends. Now I've, uh, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I've, I've provided on seven slides here, overviews of seven studies, uh, all from longitudinal cohort studies, all of them looking at the three smoking cessation outcomes I described at the start, quit intentions, quit attempts, and quit success. All of them funded by um, public health uh, authorities or bodies. So I've not included any of the studies funded by tobacco or e-cigarette industry. These are all um, public health funded studies. And all of them comparing uh, users of non-tobacco, non-menthol flavors to uh, tobacco and users of tobacco and menthol flavors. I'll summarize one or two, um, but otherwise I've provided the QR codes and the summaries of the remaining studies. So um, many of these studies are from the PATH study. So the, the, the FDA's uh, flagship longitudinal cohort study, uh, this study by uh, Abigail Friedman and Jew in 20, 2020 concluded that adults who vaped flavored e-cigarettes were more likely to subsequently quit smoking than those who use unflavored and but therefore banning flavors altogether may be too blunt of an instrument for the, the current problem. I'm just going to quickly go through some of these, sir. Um, from the, uh, the International Tobacco Control Four Country Smoking and Vaping Surveys, so surveys conducted over the US, England, Australia and Canada, concluded that use of uh, fruit and other sweet flavored e-liquids is positive related to smokers transition away from cigarettes. And the results indicate that vapors who use sweet flavors more likely to transition away from cigarette smoking and quit cigarette use, at least in the short term, compared with those who use tobacco or unflavored nicotine vaping products. And I'll just give one more and then leave as a summary for the rest. Um, Chen, 2018, uh, found that e-cigarette users of one and multiple non-tobacco menthol flavors uh, were significantly more likely to have reduced or quit smoking over the past year compared to non-e-cigarette users. And there, there are another four studies which uh, conclude very similar findings about the added benefit of flavored ends. Um, I also want to, I'll leave these here. I won't go into too much detail, but another factor to consider with the efficacy of flavors is what happens when those flavors are no longer legally available to purchase. Um, perhaps they're illicitly available, but uh, let's assume that when, when legal access is, is withdrawn, um, we ask the question, what, what uh, will people who are currently smoking do in relation to e-cigarettes? And what will those people who have already completely switched to vaping, what will they do when they are preferred e-cigarette flavor, perhaps the flavor they've benefited from, uh, what will they do when those flavors are no longer accessible? And what these two studies find, find again, again, the QR codes are there for further uh, reading, um, is that a substantial proportion of people who have already switched from cigarettes to vaping would switch back in the event that their preferred non-tobacco, non-menthol flavor uh, were to be banned. And so to conclude, um, I just want to emphasize there is good evidence from high quality longitudinal cohort studies that flavored ends are more popular and are more effective in helping adult smokers to quit compared to tobacco flavored ends. And this suggests that preserving adult smokers access to a diverse marketplace of flavored ends may be an effective method of accelerating smoking cessation rates among adults. 
However, um, the FDA is seeking, and they have they have stated this uh, consistently since 2021, they are seeking more convincing product-specific evidence of the efficacy uh, of flavoured ends for switching adult smokers with this uh, data ideally obtained from one or more randomised control trials or longitudinal cohort studies. Um, thank you very much for listening and happy to take questions uh, after after uh, Neil's presentation. Thanks, Dan, Chris. And uh, the flavour question is one that's always controversial and difficult to understand from those that haven't gone through the that the, are taking the time to talk to consumers about how flavors really impacted their journeys away from cigarette combustion. Um, so hopefully some good conversation to come in a few minutes after we hear from uh, Dr. Sherwood. Um, and he's going to share with us his thoughts on the role of nicotine uh, in this process of, of, of moving from combustible products to uh, reduced risk products. Great. Thank you very much, Jeff. And uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Um, I'm going to go straight to my first slide. I hope everybody can see that okay. Is that on the screen? Yep. Yeah, it's there. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, I haven't put a cover slide here. I was partly conscious of the fact that we were sort of limited to the 10 minute uh, list. And I thought you have my coordinates and my background in the uh, introduction from the R Street guy. So um, I'll, I'll, add, I'll add a cover slide just to the deck here. So that if anybody wants it afterwards, you're reminded it's actually from me. Um, so the presentation today is going to be technical, partly in nature, but also partly personal. I mean, I was a smoker up until about five years ago, and then I transferred over to vaping, um, which I've continued to do since then. I had no problem in the transition at all. It was, there was a, a few months where I was dueling, but basically it was absolutely fine. So let's talk about how nicotine was involved in that. And really this first slide, let me see if I can bring it pull screen actually. Uh, 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 slideshow. There we go. So this slide basically summarizes everything I want to say today. I almost feel like I'd leave it up there and go straight to the questions. Um, what you're looking at here is an opportunity sample, which was taken from the um, ongoing uh, National Health Service Health Survey for England, um, where at this particular occasion, smoking habits were recorded and a saliva sample was assayed for cotinine. Uh, cotinine being the major metabolite of nicotine. Um, and this was from several thousand individuals which were purport to represent a um, cross-section of the uh, English uh, community. So they're age four to 65 plus, and uh, they were smokers and non-smokers. And what you, in fact you can see is there's two distributions on the screen there. You've got a light gray distribution, which are people who were non-smokers or claimed to be non-smokers. And then on the right-hand side, you have a darker gray, which is those people who say that uh, they were smokers. And uh, the original intention here was to try to identify a cutoff value in terms of saliva cotinine. So you could identify from an objective measure who was a smoker and a non-smoker. And it was set actually at 12 nanograms per milliliter of um, saliva cotinine. That's where the arrow sits there. Um, but for our purposes, I think the, the most interesting thing here is that uh, if you just look at the smokers distribution on the right-hand side, it's huge. The number of, <laughs> yeah, we're talking order of magnitude in terms of saliva cotinine. It goes from the homeopathic to the heroic in terms of actually the levels of nicotine which people are achieving and reaching, or they were in this sample, which was taken in 2008. Okay, so things probably have changed with time. And the environmental tobacco smoke issue has moved on to, to another level here. Um, but basically, if you consider the x-axis there is logarithmic, these are order of magnitude differences in terms of how much nicotine smokers are taking from the product, which is which is incredible if you think about it. So, and it rather reminds me of an early meeting uh, when I was working in the uh, tobacco industry. I had to, uh, when we were first thinking about harm reduction products, and we thought maybe there's something to be learned from these experts in pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic modeling. And we had some people from a, a consultancy who worked with the pharma industry come into the office. And uh, we discussed what we wanted to do. And then they turned around and said, well, what's the target dose? And I showed them this and said, whatever the smoker wants. What What is the target dose? It could be any of those or all of them. So there is something going on here. You sort of face the fact that at least from this sample, and it's probably not that much changed uh, today, uh, smokers can achieve and do actually have a range of exposures to uh, nicotine, which are, which are quite massive. So... Let's see if I can get this to go to the next slide. So what are the influences? What's going on here? What's causing this? Well, first of all, of course, you've got information about the, the cigarette and how this is used. And for our purposes, we're still talking about smokers being the major target for tobacco harm reduction. 
Although I think that we're going to have to look in the future more and more to uh, oral tobaccos used in other countries. Um, we're talking about some of the traditional um, products which are, you know, pervasive in, in Southeast Asia, for example. So there's another issue of tobacco production going on there. But I mean, basically, if we go through the list, I mean, there's nothing here, I guess you guys wouldn't know. And there's probably more than I put down here. You talk about the number of cigarettes people have smoked in a day. That will influence the bench of their coating level, the strength of the cigarettes, um, the smoking style, the number of puffs, the inhalation level, for example. Um, <laughs> excuse me. You've got the genetics of nicotine uptake, uh, basically, you know, the, the way that the uh, nicotine receptor in the brain may be upregulated or downregulated by exposure. And of course, the metabolism of the nicotine is actually geared from the system. And some strong evidence that people do metabolize nicotine in a slightly different way. And then you have the issue of protonate and non-protonate and nicotine form, form. So whether the chemistry has a big impact on the exposure. So that, that's part of the issue here. Um, the other question, of course, is whether there's individual preferences which influence, shall we say, the smoking behavior, and whether this influences the type of or the amount of nicotine that people wish to take. Um, one could be that there's some evidence that uh, the amount of smoking is depending on the degree of nicotine dependence. So those who are measured to be more dependent on nicotine will probably smoke more, uh, probably smoke stronger products, uh, we do it for longer. And there's also the suggestion that this could be attempts to control the psychological state of the individual. So rather than being, if you like, a reaction to addiction, it's a more a sort of coping mechanism to deal with everyday problems um, and enhancing, uh, you know, people's feelings and their attitudes and their functions. Um, but I'll get into that debate because that's a that's a, that's a day's topic in itself, though that might be quite interesting for the future. What I do want to say that in either way, the psychological needs of the subject are being met. And because they're being met, the experience is liked. So it's quite interesting if you actually do anything on abuse liability, you know the primary measure of basically liking. And whether that liking in the sense that it's dealt with my addiction or liking in the sense of like it in the same way, a big steak or, or, or a bean fritter, th there seems to be no difference. There's no, I have yet to find a cutoff value which tells me if I'm like this much, it's normal. If I'm like this much, it's addictive. So that's an, a sort of a debate we come to. Um, but basically what we come down to is the, the relative impact of each of these parameters is still a subject of research. And again, just preparing this um, presentation, it reminded me the old story of um, the low tar and nicotine books, which were around at the turn of the century. Um, those of us who were long enough in the to remember, there was a big date which sort of basically came to name with the publication of the US uh, Cancer Institute Monograph 13, um, which had suggested or put evidence to show that those people who were smoking these Lutara nicotine cigarettes um, smoked in a different way, and therefore their um, exposure to problems or the exposure to tar is no different, which I guess is correct to some degree, correct. However, debate at the time was all about compensation. And why I mean by compensation, I think they were saying the people are smoking these things more intensively and taking deeper front puffs. Um, in fact, when you look at NCI monograph 13, the deciding factor was not that. The deciding factor was simply number of cigarette smoke play. That's where actually the piece of evidence that really swung the issue. You can talk about one thing, but in fact, these parameters are all different. Of course, today we've got a similar situation happening. We have a move towards having uh, uh, reduced nicotine flux or reduced nicotine cigarettes. And the suggestion is that people could or should or would smoke these more intensively, um, or they might smoke all of them. Uh, Both of those things seem to be happening, but I suspect that's more to do with the fact that cigarettes are hugely disliked by the smoker, not because they're actually... <laughs> it's almost like this dislike is over overriding their need, to be quite honest with you. Anyway, let's move to the implications of this. So... We recognize that there is the massive, if you like, uh, difference in terms of what exposure smokers will come to. We've suggested there may be some physical and psychological reasons why they would um, expose that. Um, but I think what we have to agree on is that there are a, a, a wide range of um, nicotine exposures. Um, and individuals appear to titrate nicotine delivery, um, and it implies that they're motivated to do so, um, either because this is a response to their nicotine addiction or because they are seeking some sort of nicotine uh, additional effects, uh, functional effects, regardless of their addiction. Um, or you can accept both reasons, I guess. There's no reason why not. Um, so um, what this seems to me to suggest is that medicinal nicotine products, NRT, which are generally available in limited strengths and uh, generally um, 
deliver through fixed deliveries on cold schedules are in the very the nature of the way they are used they're much less likely to actually provide the uh, smoker with what they want or what their needs are um so uh i, I think that this is could explain why the efficacy of these drugs is generally low as uh don showed at the beginning of the the whole uh, discussion here um, and generally, they're limited those people who are playing into it. I mean, you, you go to get a script for an RT from your medic, um, or you go to the pharmacy and buy it at the counter, because you already decided in advance that's what we're going to do. So it's good uh, that you should uh, basically have a plan to do so. But even the efficacy is rather low. Consumer products, the sort that we're talking about, would constitute tobacco harm reduction products, the electronic cigarettes, pouches, gums, um, are available in a variety of strengths. And as Chris has sort of said, in a variety of flavors as well, they don't generally describe you patterns. Uh, they are more likely to meet consumer needs. And not surprisingly, perhaps, therefore, their efficacy smoking cessation is superior. And that both for planned quit attempts and also for spontaneous quit attempts. There's no evidence that people who just think they will try to use a cigarette and they do so. And uh, suddenly they realize they haven't actually dual use at all. They've given up the cigarette completely. And that's exactly my case. As I said at the beginning, there's exactly what happened to me. I was a spontaneous smoking quitter because I didn't actually think about doing it, but it just happened. Um, so what do we come down to? I mean, basically, the nicotine is going to be a key part of what actually motivates to use the product. I mean, that goes without saying. Um, and the opportunity to access nicotine products with a variety of strength better meets the needs of those who smoke cigarettes and enhances their possibility of quitting, uh, whether that's planned or spontaneous. And to get us back up on time, Jeff, I'll call it there. Thank you, Neil. And uh, thanks to all of our speakers that joined us this afternoon. Um, very insightful and very uh, thought-provoking um, uh, uh, concepts for us to think about as 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 we 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 take on the challenges associated with um, guiding policy and informing our friends, families, loved ones, and the the, the community at large in terms of what could be ways to to have uh, a significant impact on the cost associated with using combustible products. Um, so, so I want to start with, uh, since I'm the, 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 the guy leading the panel, um, I'll start with my question first, and then we have about 10 minutes or so left and we'll get to a couple others hopefully as well as we go forward. But, you know, when I think back to, to the early two thousands, when a lot of these, uh, new products started to hit the marketplace, it was really a wild west. There were all different types of products, all different types of flavors, all different types of formats. And then obviously that led to some challenges within the, within the marketplace in terms of, of, you know, really understanding what our consumers were being exposed to and what were in the products and so forth. And so some regulation was definitely needed at, at, at that point so that consumers can be at least made more aware of uh, the source of the products that they were, they were uh, using. But also at the same time, we saw a lot of this natural transition from smoking uh, cigarettes to these uh, these new novel products that were on the marketplace. So, you know, with the onset of the, the, the Center for Tobacco Products and the regulatory burdens that have come since, the, the market has changed. We really have two different forms of a marketplace. One where uh, there have been a handful full of uh, reduced risk products that received marketed granting orders um, from the CTP that are legally marketed. And then there's a lot of products that are on the market that haven't received um, or have even received market denial denial, denial orders um, that, are, that are kind of flooding the marketplace as well. Um, you know, in terms of thinking about a sustainable future uh, to allow for these products to, to be both successful um, from the manufacturing perspective, in terms of uh, able to be marketed uh, legally, uh, from the consumer perspective, having um, the products that will help them move away from combustion and, and the regulation that, that, that's required in between those two things. Um, how do you guys, what do you, what do you folks feel are the important characteristics that should be maintained in order to build both an effective and viable industry uh, going forward? And again, we'll talk specifically about the U.S., but I'm sure it could be extrapolated to countries across the globe. If anyone take uh, that, 
I'll I'll take a stab. Um, to stay with flavors, then um, I just don't see uh, the the progress that's been uh, achieved in the past uh, five plus years in reducing smoking adult smoking prevalence uh, will be sustained if if the only products that adult smokers have to choose from are a handful of older generation tobacco flavored products. I think um, it's beyond any reasonable doubt that the uh, the mass migration from smoking to vaping has been driven by non-tobacco flavored products. And I do think when you take that away, uh, if it is to be taken away as it seems to be, then yes, uh, a, a small proportion I would estimate will continue to vape with available tobacco flavor products. But I worry about the larger proportion and what they're going to do. Are they going to go back to smoking? Because, um, and and as as Don mentioned as well, if there's no flavor incentive, and and increasingly in jurisdictions there's no price incentive incentive to vape instead of smoke. Um, you know that a lot of the discussion here has been about what incentivizes behavior change and taking away flavors and taking away price advantage uh will disincentivize people from sticking with vaping disincentivize smokers from thinking about vaping giving vaping a try so i just worry that and i and i maybe in one of my disclaimers i should say i i don't smoke and i don't vape i have no personal i've never taken a puff of either in my life I've got no personal, um, you know, experience or, or uh, sort of investment in this, but um, I just for, for the for the agency that, that that says let's be guided by the science and and follow the data, mm -hmm. the data as far as I can tell are clearly pointing towards a huge added benefit of non-tobacco flavor products and the very real risk of losing losing that advantage uh that benefit um if they are cleared from the market yeah i mean i thought that's very well put i i just add too that there are a couple of um major initiatives that might that are in the works whether exactly what exactly happens with them on the um combustive side and that's the uh tobacco product standard that will ban menthol cigarettes and there's also the dis development of a product tobacco product standard that would only allow for uh, these very low nicotine cigarettes, these non-addictive levels. And if either or both of those become regulatory reality, uh, the availability of desirable flavored e-cigarette products, I think will be, are, will be crucial to their success. Uh, you know, the menthol, I guess, is the easiest standard. If, if you ban menthol cigarettes, but don't give people the chance to get the menthol nic and nicotine they like, you know, um, our research is just to make go to the illegal markets. But I think it's just it's just obvious that that that's a problem. And I think that, that that's another thing that we should be thinking of as we as as the electronic ends markets develop. We should also be thinking about what's going on in the, in the combusted market. Okay, so I'm going to try to combine a question here, and it, it, it really it, two different questions, but uh, really pertain to the same general thoughts. Um, uh, and, and I think it's really more directed towards some of the comments that that Chris made. Um, when people design RCTs uh, evaluating flavor, um, is there a mechanism within the design of a study to at least um, determine uh, non-rejectors of flavors tested? So are there flavors that they're assigned to that they just don't like the flavor and that's what's inf influencing their their change or their lack of compliance within uh, the switching design? And the second is, you know, from your perspective, you know, how long does a study need to be in terms of the longitudinal nature of it to provide the evidence that switching has indeed occurred uh, to the point that it would meet whatever the definition of switching might be for regulatory agencies. 
Okay, so to the, if I understand the first question, a typical inclusion criterion in these studies would be a willingness to be randomized to one of the available mm -hmm. uh, products being assessed. So if you have five conditions, you make people aware of what those what happens in each of those conditions and ask if they're willing to be randomly assigned to any of those and you make them aware you have a 20% a chance of ending up in either one or however many arms there are. Um, so you typically only include people who are willing to be in the tobacco flavor group or the mango flavor group or the menthol flavor group, and you exclude people without that, that you know, who have a clear, strong preference for one, but not others. Mm -hmm. So I, I hope that that is the answer to that question. Um, duration. So FDA has shown um, an acceptance of data submitted by multiple uh, large tobacco companies assessing their their non-combustible products, uh, when, when studies that are run up to six weeks. Um, I would say you're running a real risk, anything shorter than six weeks. And I and the, the preference if time and money permit is to go well beyond six weeks. A, a criterion for inclusion in the Cochrane review that Don mentioned is six months. So Cochrane only includes studies uh, with a, a minimum uh, follow-up assessment of six months um, but then obviously you need to take into account the logistics the practicalities the money implications of running a study of a certain size certain sample size up to six months it's probably only achievable by a small handful of companies um, so so there is compromise somewhere between six weeks and six months uh, obviously if you can go longer 12 months fantastic but um, obviously time cost um is, is a big considerations here i would say uh minimum six uh if you can go to 12 go to 12 weeks and and if you're well funded and you have the, the personnel and the, the infrastructure go to six months if you can excellent thank you um so i i know we're 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 rapidly approaching our our end today so i'd i'd, I'd like to thank all of you guys for joining us for the conversation both those listening online as well as, as our panelists. Um, we will uh, take the recorded version of this uh, presentation today and post it on the R Street website. And we will also provide links to the uh, slides that the presenters uh, use today for your uh, at least convenience to access those if you would like. Um, again, I, I appreciate uh, all of you taking the time and for the lively conversation and discussion. And uh, if you... Uh, um, watch this space. There'll be more webinars such as this addressing specific questions in terms of how do we build the marketplace of the future? How do we support policies to allow for that marketplace to thrive, to save lives? So again, I appreciate everybody joining us today and uh, I hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.